From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Let me welcome you back to the Cannabis Podcast. If this is your first time, well, here's an especially warm welcome for you. Ahead, we have 30 or 40 minutes of cannabis information all lined up for you. But before we get too far, let me remind you this program is intended for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment and perhaps educational purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. In this episode, well, we have a kilo of information to deliver for you today. We have a couple stories from OkanaganZ.com, one about the fact that finally there has been a lawsuit launched against the banks in Canada for their ridiculous discrimination against cannabis. We're also going to hear that, you know what? Cannabis smoke is not as bad as smoke from cigarettes. New study is out about that. There unfortunately have been more closures in the cannabis industry in Canada and Canopy, a name we have heard many times on the Cannabis Podcast, is involved. We have, that's our second story from OkanaganZ.com. And we've kind of given some indication in some stories we've covered in the past that Amsterdam is having a rethink about their relaxed attitude to cannabis, especially with tourists in the red light district. Story on that. And a story that I find really interesting because we haven't done much of this. We've been talking, of course, about THC and CBD, and, and then we discovered terpenes and the magic of terpenes and how they're contributing to the effects and the aroma of cannabis. But we haven't spent much time talking about flavonoids. Well, we're going to stop that today, and we're going to cover off what are marijuana flavonoids and what impact do they have in our lives. Plus, on Cultivar Corner today, it's Sitka Legends Pineapple Cali Mist a very, very invigorating sativa, and that's coming up on Cultivar Corner. All of that and more on episode 117 of the Cannabis Podcast. And of course, one of the first things I want to do every episode is thank you for being a listener and thank a couple of other people for some special opportunity to be a listener or to be a supporter. Thanks to Kevin and Jordana for their support with buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast. And I also want to especially thank Rob, who we talked about last episode. Uh, Rob is my first patron on Patreon. You can check that out at a link at cannabispodcast.com. So thanks a lot for coming along for that ride, Rob. Really appreciate it. And a shout out to a couple other people. Shout out to Gord. We're going to be talking about one of Gord's ideas a little bit later in the episode. And a shout out to Dan from King Palm. And we'll be talking a little bit more about him later too. Now, I've mentioned Gord, a listener who has uh, been, I think, with us for a while now, haven't you, Gord? He sent me a few notes, a few comments, and he had a really interesting idea. And I thought I would throw it out and let's discuss it and see whether there are others who have some interesting perspective as well. Gord's idea is maybe I could occasionally do a cult of our corner, the home version. <laughs> you know, we used to have TV shows where they would have a board game and, and you would get the home edition. Well, maybe maybe that's an approach. And so Gord suggested that. I'm, I'm going to give you a, a bit of what he, what he read and what he sent to me on this discussion. Because he has what he considers prairie genetics that have since crossed to a more equatorial line and all of the supposed lines are highly questionable, as you might imagine. He's been wondering if you'd, I would like to receive flowers without any information whatsoever. He tells me that all of his flowers is grown in prairie gumbo, which is the very best soil in Saskatchewan, and amended with Gaia green products. Of course, it's grown indoors with LED lights. He doesn't ever use any kind of sprays for pest management. He has not had a single issue with pests since he's gone to the gumbo. And Gord says, because people like me don't grow for the market, I don't really care too much about yield, eye-appealing trimming, looser, airy bud, or longer-growing varieties. I mostly care about effects and the scent profile in the jar. To me, all cannabis tastes like South Saskatchewan puddle mud since I only smoke from a number of homemade pipes and never from a vape. My current favorite was made from a red rock that I found on the roadway, and I fixed a long stem made from wild cherry after steam bending it. I guess what I'm asking is that if you do a cultivar corner with homegrown bud, 
Do you think you'd use the same metrics for homegrown as you would for store-bought weed? Perhaps a different approach would encourage more home growers to send their samples for you to test. That is all to say that I assume that you want this to happen. Perhaps you don't. And I fully understand and accept your feelings either way. Well, Gord, thanks for putting that out there. I am all for it. And I think I agree. I think it requires a different set of criteria to determine that because we're not going to spend the same care and, and quality and, and the time involved for those really fine, fine trim jobs. So I'm up for the task. Uh, if anybody feels so inclined, you can send me a message through the Cannabis Podcast system, or you can send it to info at CannabisPodcast.com. If you are a grower, a home grower, and you would like to have your weed featured on a home edition of Cultivar Corner, feel free to send a note. I think it's a great idea, Gord, and we'll see where it goes. It doesn't matter how high the THC is. The entourage effect is always waiting for you here. This is the Cannabis Podcast. It has long been a problem in the cannabis industry for people running retail stores or any part of the whole chain of activity that happens to get bank accounts. And to get bank accounts without a whole lot of of pressure and and without having to do an incredible amount of paperwork and just ridiculous things that people who run standard businesses don't have to deal with. Well, this is a story from OkanaganSea.com, our friend David Wiley. A class action lawsuit has been launched against several major Canadian banks accusing them of financial discrimination. The Bank of Montreal, CIBC, Desjardins Federation, National Bank, Royal Bank, and TD Bank are named. For far too long, Canadian banks have treated the cannabis industry like pariahs, as if it was still completely illegal. By doing so, they're depriving the Canadian, but especially the local economy, of developing a promising market, says Maxime Guerin, a lawyer with Quebec-based law firm Group SGF, cannabis legal advisors and consultants. The class action lawsuit, which has not yet been authorized, is on behalf of Gabriel Balanger, the founder of Origami Extraction alleging the banks have engaged in financial discrimination against those in the legal cannabis industry in Canada. The class action includes all individuals or corporations that, directly or indirectly, do business with the major defendant banks and who are involved in the legal cannabis industry since October 17, 2018, says Group SGF. Many cannabis microproducers have complained over the years of the high fees and onerous hoops they're forced to jump through. Allegations include... Denials of opening bank accounts, sudden closures of current bank accounts, and denials of access to various financial tools such as mortgage loans and credit lines for legal cannabis industry businesses. Indeed, it's common knowledge in the cannabis industry that the big banks refuse any form of financing and even refuse the opening of current bank accounts in addition to refusing certain operations, in particular, international operations which are completely legal, says Group SGF on its website. And I think, frankly, it's about time. It's absolutely insane that, a, that an industry that has been legal for four years now is still subjected to such discrimination, and it drives me just a little bit bonkers. This story is a result of some recent training that I did. Felt it was time to do a bit more upgrading. Came across a site called CannabisTrainingCanada.ca, and... Its focus is to train retail, to make the people in retail as knowledgeable as they can about cannabis and a whole bunch of the processes. I actually found the training pretty good. I did just their accelerated, or rather their expert version. I didn't want to pay the additional amount to do the basic one because I figured I was probably, hopefully beyond that. Turns out I was, so. (laughs) But as a result of doing some of that, It reminded me of the fact that not only are we talking about the effective cannabis that comes from the THC, the CBD, and all of the lovely terpenes that are associated with it, but the flavonoids. And we never hear about the flavonoids. So I thought it was time to change that. And not surprisingly, Leafly has a story about what are cannabis flavonoids and what do they do. When we consider the 200 or more bioactive compounds that have been discovered in cannabis, Often the more widely understood phytocannabinoids and terpenes tend to steal the spotlight. But these aren't the only important compounds produced by cannabis. Take flavonoids, for example. They account for roughly 10% of these known compounds with around 20 varieties known to exist in cannabis. 
Flavonoids are not unique to the cannabis plant. Scientists have identified thousands of them all throughout nature, from flowers to fruits and vegetables. However, there are some that are known to be found only within cannabis, and these are known as canaflavins. Similar to terpenes, flavonoids share a role in how we perceive cannabis through our senses. But there's a lot more to flavonoids than what meets our nose and taste buds. In fact, flavonoids are among the most understudied compounds found within the plant. However, here's what we do know about them. Flavonoids exist throughout nature. They're made up of groups of polyphenolic compounds that act as secondary metabolites to a myriad of plants and fungi. With over 6,000 varieties of flavonoids discovered, their functions span a diverse spectrum. The word flavonoid actually stems from the Latin term flavus, referencing the color yellow as it appears in nature. This makes sense considering a primary function of flavonoids is to provide color pigmentation to plants, notably in flowers, for the purpose of attracting pollinators. Many plants, including a large majority of edible fruits and vegetables containing non-green pigmentation, owe their bright colors in part to flavonoids. Flavonoids are also partly responsible for protecting plants against the elements, such as potentially harmful UV rays, pests, and diseases. We often attribute the flavors and aromas of cannabis to terpenes. However, flavonoids also play an important role in providing the distinguishing qualities we use to differentiate between strain varieties. Both odor and flavor are possible in cannabis due to the synergistic qualities that terpenes and flavonoids share with one another. Moreover, flavonoids also affect the pigmentation of cannabis, just as they do with other flowers. Those beautiful deep purple cannabis strains owe their coloration to the flavonoids known as anthoxanthins or anthocyanins. In other plants, such as berries, anthocyanin may cause red, purple, or even blue coloration depending on pH levels. If providing color pigmentation, odor, flavor, and protection weren't enough, research has shown that flavonoids are also highly pharmacologically active, including preliminary research indicating the medicinal benefits of the canflavins found exclusively in cannabis. Take, for instance, the flavonoid quercetin, which can be found in many fruits and vegetables. This compound is a known antifungal and antioxidant. Catechins, a flavonoid found in cocoa, teas, and other palm fruits, is also known to be an antioxidant with cardiovascular health benefits. In cannabis, canflavin A is pharmacologically active, with studies showing it has a strong anti-inflammatory properties, and that might be stronger than those found in aspirin. Canflavin B and C are also being studied for their potential medical benefits. Other highly active flavonoids found in cannabis include orientin, quercetin, silmarin, and camphorol, all with anti-inflammatory, antifungal, antioxidant, and anti-cancer potential. We'll see what future studies take us. The entourage effect is a widely used term that describes the synergistic nature of the many pharmacologically active compounds in cannabis. Our bodies are equipped with an endocannabinoid system, a vast network of receptors that cover almost every organ and system within us. Cannabinoids bind to these receptors to produce different effects, which are further influenced by terpenes and cannabinoids. The reason why certain combinations of these biomolecules make us feel different is due to the synergistic properties of these various compounds. Cannabidiol, CBD for instance, modulates the effects of THC at the blood-brain barrier. Flavonoids are thought to have similar synergistic abilities. Whether they enhance the properties of cannabinoids or modulate their efficacy is not fully known and will require further research. Coined by S. Ben Shabbat and Dr. Raphael Meshulam in 1998, the entourage effect has become commonplace in cannabis research. Dr. Meshalom, as well as other scientists such as Ethan Russo and James McPartland, are among the few today working to uncover the mysteries of flavonoids as they exist in cannabis. However, flavonoid research in cannabis remains vastly understudied, especially in the U.S., due to the strict federal roadblocks that prevent cannabis research at large. In order to better understand the role that cannabis flavonoids play, it is extremely important that federal actions be lifted in the U.S. to allow further research to take place. Until that point comes, researchers abroad continue to uncover new discoveries in chemical profiling, allowing us to better understand the complex mysteries of cannabis. 
And now here's where you get the first prediction from the Cannabis Podcast on the future we are likely to see. As I was researching this story and, and looking at the details, I couldn't help but think of the fact back when we first achieved legalization in Canada, October 17th, 2018, over four years ago, and as I've mentioned many times on the podcast, there was no mention whatsoever of terpenes at that point. We were still into THC at about 20% was really high THC at that moment. And while we knew that there was a smell and aroma and effect associated to cannabis, we didn't yet have the word terpene in broad use in our language. Well, here we are four years later, and I can pick up pretty well any package of cannabis now. And not only are terpenes mentioned, they are listed in terms of percentages that are appearing in my cannabis. So I predict four Five years from now, they'll have made enough depth into the research of flavonoids to be able to identify specific flavonoids that you know interact with your beta caryophylline or your myrcene, and now your terpene profile becomes your terpene flavonoid profile, and you can really dial in what you're hoping to get out of your cannabis. Sound about right? <laughs> Check back in five years. We'll see whether or not it became a reality. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner, go to the corner, oh yeah. Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Cultivar Corner today, it's another BC bud. Another very aromatic BC bud. The last few we seem to have had have just been so abundant in aroma. And this one is no different. What are we doing today? Well, we're going back to Sitka. Sitka Legends. Uh, we've done some of their product in the past. Some of their sub-brands, Green Aid Quirkle, comes to mind. as being one of my favorite strains that I've ever done. And that came from the folks at Sitka. Now we're dealing with Pineapple Cali Mist. A sativa dominant, THC 28.8%. And total terps at 4.62%, and that's one of the things we'll be talking about, because I'm getting different values for those terpenes, and in fact, different terpenes, depending on where I look. So, this Sitka Legend, Pineapple Cali Mist, was grown by Quad Essence, which is one of the microgrowers that grows for Sitka Works. Let's give you the story, first of all, on Quad Essence. So, Quad Essence is one of the legendary microproducers housed and grown out of the Sitka Micro Park, which is located in Souk, B.C. Best friend Steve and Carl sacrificed a lot to get from Legacy to Legal. They bring decades of experience and unique methods to the game, ensuring top-notch quads. Best friends grow best. Quad essence, everything they touch, turns to gold. It's been a long time coming. I think we put in the time. That's what it takes to grow. When you get flowers from our facility, you know it's had that care and attention. And that was Steve Tapp, one of the best friends. Let's talk about the brand we're talking about today. Pineapple Cali Mist. What's the legend behind it? And what's its history? Its lineage? Well, as we say, crafted by Quad Essence, it's a cross of Pineapple Express and Cali Mist. This flower from Quad Essence has a sweet tropical vibe and floral earthy tones. Pineapple Cali Mist provides a very uplifting high, perfect for a night out with friends. So, oh, as I have said so many times when I've opened up weed lately, is it just getting more aromatic? Is it getting more stinky? Mmm. Oh, this is just so heavy on the limonene, which is the first point of discussion <laughs> on my bag. My terpenes are showing dominant terpenes, limonene 1.84%, beta-myrcene 0.75%, and beta-caryophylline 0.37%. When I look on the sitkalegends.com website, which of course you'll find the link in the show notes, you'll notice the dominant terpenes don't even mention limonene. <laughs> uh, caryophylline, bisodol, bisodol, myrcene, and humulene are listed as the dominant terpenes on the website. And I got to think that limonene is there. It is so heavy on the citrus notes. Oh, just, just so flavorful. And these are really sticky buds too. 
as I was breaking that up, getting ready for the joints and the uh, Crafty Plus, stick them down on my table, just put my finger on that, and it holds the bud really well, really sticky weed. And as you break it up, there's even more of those aromas that are coming out. Mm -mm -mm. Just delightful. Let's take a peek through the jeweler's loop, see what kind of terpenes, or rather trichomes, we can see. I wish we could see terpenes. <laughs> My my uh, human eye is not that powerful that I can detect the terpenes in the cannabis. If I reach that point, I'll let you know. Now, the buds are fairly loose. They're definitely sativa buds, not as tight as some of the stuff that's out there. And interestingly enough, the bud that I've got in my package <laughs> looks remarkably like the bud that's on the website. The picture they have, Pineapple Cali Mist. You can check that on the show notes, and you'll see that my bud's looking pretty well the same. Looks like that bud's pretty sticky. My bud is pretty sticky. Now, a couple of things that I haven't mentioned yet. The THC range on the website listed is 26 to 31%. My THC is 28.8. And the terpenes, 1.2%. And yet my terpenes are sitting at 4.62%. And again, different terpenes than are listed on the website. Are they just trying to confuse us stoners? Is that what this is all about? <laughs> I don't honestly know what the rationale behind that is, but I can tell you what the rationale behind my next action is. It's time to give a try to Pineapple Cali Mist from Sitka, grown by Quad Essence, a lovely sativa, and here we go. Yeah, that limonene, you open the bag, it smacks you in the face, <laughs> you roll a joint, kind of smacking you in the face as you're rolling that joint. You light the joint, you smoke it, and it's smacking you in the face once more. Really heavy on the linalool. Or no, sorry, the limonene. <laughs> even though on the website there is no limonene even listed, yet on my bag, limonene sitting at 1.84%, the most dominant terpene. Smooth smoke. Mm, nice and easy on the lungs. Not getting any harshness. Watching the ash come off. And predominantly white. Falling off rather nicely. Oh, and there's already some of those happy eyes. That's the thing I love about a nice sativa to get me rolling in the morning. Looking for some creativity, some focus, some kind of... That's my intent today. And we've talked a little bit of before, probably not enough, um, that we should talk about what the intent of your purpose for smoking the, the cannabis is. What do you uh, hope to achieve? Because that set and setting will help to contribute to the intent <laughs> if you line it all up. So today is kind of a... Um, what have I got to do today? I got some domestic duties to take care of and probably some upkeep on some of the podcast details, so some administration on that. Would like some creativity, may try working on a couple of new pieces as well. Had some new ideas for segments for the podcast. We'll start talking about those things. So that's my goal today, and that's why I'm hoping for a very focus-forward sativa. Oh, yeah, and here it comes. Mm -mm -mm. Slapping those eyes. <laughs> Now let's have a taste from the Crafty Plus. Mm. And as you've heard me say so many times, the flavor that comes out of the Crafty Plus is just mm, so delicious, especially when the weed is delicious. So I'm definitely getting that sweet tropical vibe out of the vaporizer. A little bit of those earthy tones. There's That mirror scene is going to give us some of those earthy notes. Mm. Oh, pretty fast at the eyes. And I love it. That's my favorite part of a nice sativa. <laughs> is when I feel those happy eyes come on and... Ah, I just want to close them and sit back and enjoy the high. <laughs> That's kind of where I am right now. It is so cool that there are so many micro growers in our province that have hooked up with somebody who's helping them distribute it, as in the case with Sitka Works and Quad Essence, 
growing their pineapple Cali mist. And in those ensuing moments, <laughs> in between the last statement and this, once more my furnace came on, I continued to finish the joint, I finished the Crafty Plus, and my high has escalated. Have I ever said, I like being high? I guess I have said that a few times. <laughs> And today is another case where I love being high. This is exactly what I was looking for today. A nice upfront, head forward, sativa high, nice happy eyes. Got some lovely euphoria going on. Feeling a little creative, feeling a little inspired to do some stuff. So this may be the time to do it. If you're looking for a nice sativa, I picked up seven grams of the pineapple Cali mist from Sitka Legends, grown by Quad Essence. And... I gotta say, in that souk cannabis park, they're growing some pretty darn good weed. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. Did you hear the news? <laughs> uh, if you if you have ever used raw rolling papers, you heard the news. <laughs> Yes, I'm sure you did. Uh, Raw, it was not a good week for Raw. And here's a summary of of why it wasn't a good week for Raw. And I'm going to take a a little bit of this from my friend, again, David Wiley at theokanakanz.com. And (laughs) I also have some other pieces that dive really right into the whole reason why Raw was in trouble. If you haven't heard, Raw lied. Raw lied a lot. (laughs) Here's the other story from the Okanagan Sea. Popular rolling paper brand Raw has been caught in a web of lies. The company got spanked in U.S. court after a judge ruled its advertising claims were deceptive. Some of the bombshells? Raw Foundation doesn't exist. No funds or proceeds from sales were donated to that charity. Their rolling papers are not unrefined. The papers are not organic. They're not made using wind power, and they're not produced in Alcoy, Spain. (laughs) And in fact, I'm going to dive into the press release, which has a bit more of these details. Now, interestingly enough, this all came about because Republic Brands went to court, obtaining an injunction, saying all this stuff that Raw was saying is not right. And it appears the courts agreed. (laughs) And here's from the press release. The jury finds HBI engaged in unfair competition and violated the Illinois Uniform Deceptive Trade Practices Act through its rolling paper packaging and promotional activities. Federal court orders HBI to cease promoting, selling, distributing, shipping, and delivering certain products that are sold in packaging, including Alcoy Spain Stamp, and cease making other promotional statements. HBI ordered to cease making claims that it contributes its funds or sales proceeds to a non-existent charitable foundation referred to as the Raw Foundation. On January 31, 2023, the United States District Court of the Northern District of Illinois permanently enjoined HBI from making certain claims about its products and ordered them to immediately cease manufacturing, ordering, or replenishing its inventory with goods that fail to conform to the court's order. The order permanently prohibits HBI and its personnel from making any statement or communication, or engaging in any promotion or advertising activity that states, implies, or suggests that HBI and or RAW operates or contributes its funds or sales proceeds to a charitable entity or foundation of any kind referred to as the RAW Foundation or making reference to the RAW Foundation in text or images, that RAW organic hemp rolling papers are unrefined, that raw organic hemp rolling papers are made with natural hemp gum, or that the adhesive used in raw organic hemp rolling papers is made from or contains hemp, that raw organic hemp rolling papers are, or ever were, the world's first or world's only organic or organic hemp rolling papers, that raw organic hemp rolling paper booklets are made in Alcoy, Spain, that raw organic hemp pre-rolled rolling paper cones are made in Alcoy, Spain, that the bulk paper bobbins used to make raw organic hemp rolling paper products is made in Spain. HBI will not use on its packaging a stamp including the use of the word Alcoy or referring to Alcoy. 
that raw organic hemp rolling papers are made using wind power or are powered by wind, that HBI uses or use the center of the hemp stalk for its raw organic hemp rolling papers, that HBI or Joshua Kesselman, who is the founder, invented rolling paper pre-rolled coins, that the OCB organic hemp papers are knockoffs, Ronabies, copies or fake versions of raw. <laughs> Amazing. First of all, that the court came down in favor of it, but now, of course, Republic brands expected to get a bit of gain off of that. <laughs> and to follow up on that thought, back to the story from David Wiley, where he says, now, if you decided not to use raw papers anymore, we've got some possible alternatives. And the first one he suggests, OCB, is, what a surprise, from the folks at Republic Brands. OCB papers are sustainable and biodegradable. They're founded in 1822 in France. They have an array of papers, including organic hemp, virgin, craft, bamboo, pure hemp. Pure hemp selection of papers come from Spain. They describe themselves as tree-free rolling paper alternative. They have classic and unbleached papers, as well as cones. Rizla's slogan is, Roll with the Legend. It's been around since 1796. Natura, bamboo, and precision are among the collection of rolling papers. Those who love them, love them a lot. Zigzag rolling papers are a market leader. The name brings to mind the iconic smoking zigzag man, a.k.a. Captain Zigzag. The papers are a smooth smoking experience, especially the white pack. And I have to say, I use them myself, and they're, they're an exceptionally easy paper to roll. And then King Palms. King Palm leaf tubes are pretty much what they sound like. They range in size from rollies that hold a half a gram to XXLs that hold five grams. They burn slow and have a distinctive taste. And I will have a little bit more to say about King Palms a little bit later on in the podcast. Wolfpack is a designer all-in-one rolling paper pack with a grinder, tray, and tips, along with the papers. They were created after the founder had a motorcycle accident and had trouble gathering all of the rolling materials with her uninjured hand. They are based in Ontario. And finally, Herbiture. Herbiture rolling papers are made from pure rice, resulting in a slow burn. They're thin, flavorless, and come with filter tips. And they are BC-based Herbiture. So there we go. If, if you, like many who used to use raw and have now heard the story and are saying, well, I'm never going to use those again, there's some opportunity for you to try something new and seven suggestions for you from the folks at OkanaganZ.com. From the cannabis-infused studio in the clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. This is an interesting story. This is from CanadaTechToday.com about a new study that has been released. And as a cannabis smoker for over 50 years now, I guess, I haven't smoked cigarettes or tobacco for almost 15 years. So it has just been cannabis for the last 15. And I'm kind of interested, if not excited, about this story. Cannabis opponents do their best to try to lump cannabis smoke and tobacco smoke into the same category. And to be fair... It's something that many people accept unless they've looked at the body of research on the topic. Anyone that has researched cannabis smoke versus tobacco smoke knows that they are not the same. And the tobacco smoke is demonstrably worse for consumers compared to cannabis smoke for various reasons. A recent study conducted in Australia found that cannabis smoke exposure is not associated with impaired lung function among consumers. The long-term inhalation of cannabis smoke does not impact lung function in the same manner as inhaling tobacco, according to longitudinal data published in the journal Respiratory Medicine. A team of Australian researchers evaluated the impact of tobacco smoking and cannabis smoking on lung function in a cohort of 30-year-old subjects. Study participants began smoking cannabis, tobacco, or both as young adults. Pulmonary performance was evaluated at age 21 and at age 30 via a spirometry assessment. Researchers reported that cigarette-only smokers already showed evidence of impaired lung function at age 30. By contrast, those who have only used cannabis ever since the adolescent period do not appear to have evidence of impairment of lung function. 
Specifically, investigators identified airflow obstructions in the lungs of cigarette-only smokers, but they observed no such obstructions in cannabis-only subjects. Authors further acknowledged co-use of tobacco and cannabis does not appear to predict lung function beyond the effects of tobacco use alone. They concluded cannabis use does not appear to be related to lung function even after years of use. The findings are consistent with those of numerous other studies, reporting that cannabis smoke exposure, even long-term, is not predictive of the sort of significant adversary pulmonary effects that are consistently associated with tobacco. Consumers who wish to mitigate or eliminate their exposure to combustive smoke may do so via an herbal vaporizer, which heats cannabinoids to the point of vaporization but below the point of combustion. In clinical trials, herbal vaporizers have been found to be a safe and effective cannabinoid delivery device, which is one of the reasons why when we do cultivar corner, we're always throwing something in our Crafty Plus, our herbal vaporizer. Now, that's an interesting story from canatechtoday.com. And I guess it's probably something that all of us cannabis smokers have thought for years, that it doesn't seem to have the same horrible effects as tobacco smoke. Nice to get a little validation. Now, I want to give a shout out to Dan. I briefly mentioned King Palms in the rundown of some new rolling papers you may want to try. And... That reminded me. <laughs> I received a message from Dan, who works at King Palm. He sent a note to me through the uh, Cannabis Podcast messaging system, said, hey, discovered the podcast, really like the quality of what you're doing, and we'd like to participate. So why don't I send you some samples and you can get an idea of what we do? So he did. And, and so I have. <laughs> In fact, part of my preparation for the episode today was to use one of the King Palm... Now, as we spoke about in the story back with David Wiley and OkanagaZ.com, they're basically a super slow burning roll. Palm leaves that you stuff your herb, in our case, of course, cannabis. And it is, I have to say, a really, really nice, slow, slow burn. So thanks, Dan. Uh, sent me just a whack of samples, a whole bunch from half a gram up to, I think, about three or four grams I've got plus some filter tips, flavored filter tips that have a squeezable terpene piece in there. You just give a little bit of a squeeze and, and you get a nice burst of blueberry flavor. And another one was banana cream, I think. Mm. So quite a delightful way to try cannabis with a different perspective. So thanks a lot for the sample pack, Dan. I truly appreciate it. And I will continue to sample. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. <laughs> This is the Cannabis Podcast. If you ever hear anything on the Cannabis Podcast that you would like to comment on, or you have some suggestions or ideas you'd like to share, please send them along to info at CannabisPodcast.com. If you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, a couple of ways you can do that. BuyMeACoffee.com slash Cannabis Podcast. You can buy me a doobie there if you feel so inclined. Or if you are on Patreon already, you can find the Cannabis Podcast on Patreon. There is also a link at CannabisPodcast.com. And you can join Rob, and I hope some others, and join the Cannabis Podcast community on Patreon. And that wraps it up for episode 117 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the cannabis-infused studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hi, it's Justin Benton, host of the Miracle Plant Podcast, where we discuss this miracle plant that goes by so many names and how it's helping people in so many extraordinary ways. So if you love this plant and you want to hear a story that tugs on those heartstrings and learn more about this plant, then head on over to the Miracle Plant Podcast. You'll be glad you did.